thank everyone for joining this. Presentations we're doing as product managers showing some of the IGUS online tools. There will be uh, questions answered at the end of the session. If you could use the chat feature to write the questions down, my colleague Nicole Lang will help mediate uh, questions after I complete this. Um, some of you may have seen this initial introduction yesterday in Nicole's, but for those of you who were not on Nicole's presentation yesterday, it's just a really quick overview of IGUS. IGUS started in 1964 in our founder's garage. We were a custom injection molder for different parts for automotive uh, industry, textile industry, food and process, food and beverage processing machinery. In the 1970s and early 80s, we stopped doing strictly custom molds and we created two different product lines. One of them is our dry tech or bearing product lines where we standardized number of materials. We started a bunch of tools where basically engineers could refer to a catalog and order parts from stock instead of having to design custom injection molded plastic parts. Also from that, um, as later you'll see, we do an incredible amount of testing. And from that test data, we're able to develop new polymer materials for bearing applications and provide lifetime information on those. Um, we are present in every, uh, every continent. We have 35 different sales offices throughout the world. Our headquarters in the U.S. is in East Providence, Rhode Island. A 225,000 square foot facility. We stock over 20 million bearings. We have an incredible 85% same day shipping. If you order and it's in stock, we get 85% of those orders out same day, 93% next day. And we have 430 people in the US as well. Uh, a high number of those, I think it's about 110 or 120 are outside salespeople, factory, direct trained by I guess, I guess employees and half work roughly for the e-chain product line which is our cable management systems and the other half work for our dry tech product line which we're discussing today specifically the linear products so what we use is base polymers so it can be any number of different materials like delrin nylon and to that we add fibers and uh, filaments to strengthen and reinforce those compounds and we also add solid lubrication so the whole idea is that our parts are dry running lubrication free, which makes them suitable in a number of different industries from agricultural applications, packaging machinery, aircraft interiors, lab, especially is a big industry for us, and lab automation machinery. So we have a huge test lab in Cologne, 41,000 square feet, a ton of testing, 11,300 tests per year. And we also have the ability to do custom customer based tests as well. If we're developing a new product or a custom part for a customer, we can perform tests in our lab there for that. All this is really important because this data that we get from our test lab feeds directly these online tools that we're going to talk about today. This is a real quick overview of what we call dry tech. So that's IGUS's bearing product lines. So all of these are, although you see a lot of metal components, extrusions, machined parts, the base technology, our real IP is the, the polymer bearing portion of this. So again, dry running, lubrication free, lightweight, corrosion resistance. And uh, obviously part of this too, be because of the way we produce the parts through injection molding, we have a huge cost competitiveness when compared to especially recirculating ball bearings. So the linear product line is called Dryland. And you with Dryland, it's very modular. You can basically start with just a liner, or we have parts that are drop-in replacement uh, for recirculating ball guides, profile guides. We also have a number of other series that are, I guess, kind of standards like this Dryland W system and low profile Dryland N. And then we also get into linear robots and gantries, as well as delta robots and drive controls. So the main point of today was to go over our online tool for the standard linear bearing product line. And we're going to go there through the website, but I just wanted to show you our, our basic igus.com page. If you click on the configurators tab, go to linear technology, it's the very top one. This one here called Dryland Linear Guides Configurator. And I'm going to hop into it right now and quickly run through a kind of a dummy application for you. Again, just go to configurators, linear technology, and you'll see a number of other configurators that we have and product finders for lead screws for actuators. There's also some customization tools for basically putting machining on lead screws. I think we're going to try to have webinars on those 
perhaps in the next couple of weeks as well. But today we're going to talk about the basic linear guides configurator. All right, so what you get first is an option to choose which dryland product range you want to, to use. As I mentioned before, we have uh, profile guides which match many of the recirculating ball bearing guides uh, dimensionally, as well as round way shafting and bearings for recirculating ball bearings based on shafting. Then we have our low profile series Dryland N, and we have our flagship model, which we call Dryland W, which is extremely modular. I will choose that one today. And basically, there's a number of different kind of configurations that comes in, uh, comes in square rail profiles, round rail profiles, extrusions that have basically double profiles so that they you don't need to align anything. These have different different widths you can choose. Today, I'm going to choose a single round bearings, so we'll need to use two rails and four bearings in this application. And here's where you can choose the the size. So we have a 10 millimeter all the way up to 25 millimeter for these. I should note too, it's kind of in a tricky spot. If you want to flip back and forth between imperial and metric, you can do it here. So this gives you the measurements in imperial dimensions. Today, I'm just going to leave it in metric because that's what the parts were designed around. We do have some inch parts for the round series that are based on imperial standard dimensions. And this is where you can toggle back and forth to get that those dimensions in either metric or imperial. So here are some different options you have. Bearing material options, we have zinc, we have stainless steel for high strength, also obviously corrosion resistance. It's a 316 stainless. You can add clamps if you want, just little manual hand clamps. In this case, I'm going to keep it fairly simple and use the very standard product, which is our 10 millimeter round bearing with standard hard anodized aluminum rail. And here's where you choose the orientation. So you can choose what position these will be oriented in, in this location, either vertical or horizontal. We're going to just going to stick with a horizontal application. So two rails, this is this asks you for this B dimension, the distance between rails. I chose 150. I kind of preloaded this earlier to save you guys some time instead of watching me plug everything in. I put in a distance between the carriages of 100 millimeters and the rail length I put at 500 millimeters. This is where I choose where the drive force is located as well as the center of gravity relative to one of the fixed side of the drive system and I'll explain that real quick here in a second. If you're only using one drive, you always want to locate the drive closest to what we call the fixed bearings. So in this case, let's call it the left set of bearings. We would have those truly define the system. Those bearings would offer very little clearance between bearing and rail to offer the precision. On the other side, we recommend using a floating bearing set, which have a little bit of extra clearance, but what that does is it optimizes the moment caused by the drive force, and it dictates that the two bearings closest to that guide the system. And if you are if you do have a drive force that's not directly in the center and do follow this, you'll actually, although you're using bearings that have clearance on one end, you'll actually have a system over time that has less play overall because the moment will be carried by the two bearings closest to that. Chris, if you don't mind posting in the chat room the link to the two to one tech talk, which explains that and fixed and floating bearings, I'd appreciate it. If you happen to use two drives on either side, a lot of times we see customers that use two lead screws or two cylinders on either side. This is where you would choose that. But for now, I'm just going to pick a single drive with fixed and floating bearings. And here is where I can locate where my drive force is located. So it's this green green icon. I can, I can drag it left and right or up and down. I'm just going to set it kind of in the center today, down a little bit. And you can also type in the numbers here. If you have them exact, measure, maybe you're measuring off your CAD step file or something. This is where I'm putting, this is where you locate the center of gravity. So the center of my mass, I'll put in the, the center of the table. You can have it offset if there's an overhung load. I'm just gonna leave it in the center for now. 
you put in your actual mass right here. I have 50 newtons chosen and I have an acceleration of one meter per second squared. If you know the overall lifetime that you're looking for to get from the bearings, you can enter it here. Typically what I do when I work on an application is I just put it at one kilometer and then I once I find that everything is working correctly, I go back and I add that distance to get the maximum travel that it will see. That does not mean that the bearings are completely worn out. That just means that there's more play in the system than than we would recommend. So I leave that at one kilometer. If you have a, an axial load back through the bearings, like you're pushing something with the bearings, this is where you would put that information. So if you're sliding a box onto a conveyor, you're pushing a box off a conveyor, something along those lines, this is where you could put in that information. And let me just kind of put something in here so it comes up. So this purple line is where you might be pushing something from. Today I'm just going to delete it. If you're not using it, you can just delete it. I accept the I guess liability disclaimer and I hit next. So this is basically the results. It shows for this particular application, everything is working okay. Important things to note is I only put in one kilometer of travel, so we don't see any wear in the Y or Z axes. Um, I'll go back and I'll kind of toggle something up so that we can see that change. It gives me my max permissible continuous average speed, and that's five meters per second. Important to note too, it tells me how much force it's going to take to move that system to overcome the static coefficient of friction, as well as it gives me safety factors. So I know in it looks like I have quite a bit of safety factor 13 times. If you find that this number gets very high, it may mean that you're using a bearing system that's too large. But let's go back here and play with the kilometers. I'm going to put in a very high number just to, to show you what it looks like if it's wearing out. So here you see I put in 90,000 kilometers. The, the part is worn. You can hit this little optimization button and it will give you information on how to how to potentially solve that. It could be through spacing bearings further apart or reducing the load. In this case, um, 90,000 kilometers is not realistic, but a lot of times we do see travels of 3,000 to 5,000 kilometers in a machine's time. In this case, wear is okay for 500 kilometers and it gives me my wear results. So this is added clearance you're seeing into the system after that travel. This is the clearance of the center of gravity after that travel as well. So there's basically half a millimeter of, of play after the part has gone 5,000 kilometers, if that makes sense. Other things that this system will do is if you refer to that two to one guide that Chris just posted into the chatter feed later, you'll learn that you'll need to keep the drive force and payload within twice the distance of the bearings on the fixed side. So in this case, my bearings we said were, I th think we put them at 100 millimeters in this direction, WX right here. That means that every acting force needs to be within 200 millimeters or else there will be binding. So in this case, I'm going to make it fail by moving my center of gravity up. Another thing you, in this screen, by the way, if you use your mouse cursor, you can uh, zoom in and out. So I, if you see, I have the center of gravity really, really high in what we call the Y direction. And here it's going to show me that it's not moving properly. And again, if you hit optimize, it will give you hints on on how to fix that. In this case, we don't want that at 400. We'll put it at 100. OK, so now you have your application ran. It looks like the parts working well. A couple of things you can do at this point. You can add it to your shopping cart and purchase it online. You can request a, a quote in case you want a quote on several hundred pieces. You could request that here. You can download the step files or 2D drawings in this location. It will take you right to the page in our CAD library for these parts. Go to the catalog. What I really like is you can download this PDF report. Really quickly here now. I had one preloaded. Well, I may as well use this one. My internet is working well today. 
This has all the information and data that you entered and that the expert system gave us in the end. So you can save this in a project folder. You have all the application information to know that the parts work. Another great feature is that I can basically save this configuration right here. You can save it to your desktop and then come back into the expert system at a later date and load it back in here. So it's a config file. It won't work on its own. You'll need to, again, save it to your desktop. And to view it, you'll need to load it back in using this load configuration and back through the expert system, and it will repopulate. So it, even if you'd worked on other applications since, you can relocate it at that point. OK, let's get back to this. So mentioned a few examples. Key industries for us are packaging machines, lab automation, 3D printers, aircraft interiors. As of late, our gantry systems, we have very low cost gantries and belt drives, actuators. These are becoming very popular for um, automation, automating processes in factories and in different settings. Uh, additional tools, we have these product finders and calculators for almost all the product lines from energy chain systems, cables to our plastic bushings. You can find them in the same location that I showed you earlier. Uh, this is a list of the US North American product managers, and we are offering a virtual tour of our 2020 newsstand. I did one with a large customer today where we had, there's two ways to do it. One is you can do a self-guided tour using the link here, but you can also request a uh, trade show booth visit in which case we have some of our colleagues in cologne who we can work with with you to do a virtual visit of the tour and to show you some of the news so if there's any interest in something like that please contact us otherwise uh, i appreciate your time and attention and i'll open it up for any questions that may have come upon